Welcome back from the break. We're on the home stretch now. Our next presentation will be provided by Pui Huber to discuss recent automated validation rules. Please join me to welcome back Pui Huber. Welcome back from your break. I hope you had a chance to recharge and are ready to dive back into our presentation. My name is Pui Huber and in this presentation, we will go over some of the recent automated validation rules. We have a couple of learning objectives. Our first learning objective is to explore the benefits and features of structured product labeling or SPL. We'll discuss how SPL streamlines data exchange, improves patient safety and adapts to industry advancements. Next, you'll understand how Cedar Direct offers user-friendly tools for um, SPL creation with built-in pre-validation for error prevention. Our third objective is to recognize the impact of the, last, the latest validation rule developments. And lastly, we'll discuss how to effectively avoid errors with the recent validation rules to make sure that we have error-free submissions. SPL is a standardized format approved by HL7 and adopted by the FDA. Key highlights of SPL include its role in facilitating efficient data exchange, which simplifies the regulatory submission process it's important to note that SPL improves patient safety through consistent data presentation. Furthermore, SPL is continuously updated to stay relevant and incorporate advancements in the industry. One of the key technical features of SPL is that it's machine readable using XML, enhancing interoperability. There are several methods to submit SPLs. Cedar Direct is an FDA tool created to submit the SPL. It's designed with ease of use in mind, ensuring a straightforward experience. It checks for errors as you input data and save, minimizing mistakes in submissions. We have step-by-step -step guidance for SPL creation under tutorials and helpful hints for which provides uh, tips to aid in completing the forms. What are validation rules? Validation rules evaluate user entered information against specified criteria to ensure that only valid data is saved in the records. This is achieved through syntax and format checks, which verify that SPL files adhere to the correct XML structured, uh, structure and required format. Cross-field validation ensures consistency and coherence of data across different fields in the SPL submissions. Cedar Direct follows the reference SPL implementation guide. We have a link here, which provides guidelines for the SPL submissions. The save and validate feature that you see here that's highlighted is a critical component of Cedar Direct's functionality. It serves as our final checkpoint before you hit that Submit SPL button. Not only does it verify the accuracy of the data you've entered, but it also provides a unique advantage by allowing you to identify and correct any potential errors or discrepancies before the submission process is um, finalized. The, the flowchart here illustrates the validation process in Cedar Direct. The process begins with creating SPL submissions in Cedar Direct, you see on the top left side, and then proceeds to save and validate the data. Here, once a user submits save and validate, 
If the validation fails, the system prompts the user to resubmit the SBL after making the necessary revisions. Then on the other hand, if the validation is successful, the SBL status will change to, uh, will mark as ready for submission. And at this stage, uh, users have the option to submit the, F the SPL. Now let's look at some of the recent validation rules starting with establishment registration. If you are submitting an update to your initial establishment registration, you must enter the FEI number. If your FEI is missing, your submission will fail validation and an error like you see in this example will be displayed. So make sure any update to your initial establishment registration has an FEI number. This year, if you submitted a new establishment registration without an FDA assigned FEI, and you are planning to submit a no change notification between October and December, Maybe there's no changes to your establishment information, address, or contact information. Please note that the renewal might fail validation if the FEI is missing. So in this case, you'll need to submit an establishment registration update with the FEI instead of a no change notification. In your product listing submission, under establishment details, the business operation selected must match the business operation code entered in the establishment registration. So for example, if you select the business operation manufacturer in your establishment, make sure that business operation entered under product listing matches. This is a long error message, but, and we will certainly not read word for word, but what it simply means is that when delisting a product, you have the marketing status as completed and an end date. The establishment registration is required, um, even if the establishment registration is expired or deregistered, we need to know who the manufacturer is and the correct business operation and qualifier must be entered. So the business operation and qualifier must match what you have in the establishment registration. If you are listing a product and the marketing category is one of these three um, approved drug product manufactured under contract, OTC monograph drug product manufactured under uh, under contract or unapproved drug product manufactured under a contract, uh, then the document type has to be either human OTC drug label or human prescription drug label. So for these marketing categories, uh, those three marketing categories we have, you cannot list them under SPL document type, bulk ingredient, or drug for further processing, for example. It has to be either human OTC drug label or human prescription drug label. If you are listing a product and the marketing category is one of these three um, approved drug product manufactured under contract, OTC monograph drug product manufactured under a under contract or unapproved drug product manufactured under contract, uh, then the document type has to be either human OTC drug label or human prescription drug label. So for these marketing categories, uh, those three marketing categories we have, you cannot list them under SPL document type, bulk ingredient, or drug for further processing, for example. It has to be either human OTC drug label or human prescription drug label. The route of administration can only be not applicable for SPL document types, drug for further processing, and bulk ingredient. So only these two SPL document types are allowed to 
have a route of administration that is not applicable. All other SPL document types must have the route of administration selected. The source NDC is a required field for any listing submissions uh, that has the business operation of relabel or repack. So if you have the business operation for one of these, repack or relabel, in your product listing, the source NDC must be provided. The source NDC product code entered cannot be associated with the listing that has a compliance action or deficiency associated with it. The source NDC that is entered must be a valid listing that is active. Any SPL document type that is a bulk ingredient with the marketing category of bulk ingredient must have one or more establishments with the business operation of API manufacture. If you are listing a bulk ingredient um, it will not pass validation unless you enter the API manufacturer's information. Starting October 1st, new marketing category and monograph citations will be mandatory for OTC drugs. When listing your OTC product, ensure that you provide the OTC monograph if applicable. Here's an example. Uh, monograph ID M001. For more information and guidance on OTC monographs, please visit the FDA's official OTC monographs uh, page here, well, which will provide you more information on this new requirement. Now let's put our knowledge to the test with a couple of challenge questions related to what we just discussed. The first one is, when the SPL document type is bulk ingredient and the marketing category is bulk ingredient, which business operation must be associated with one or more establishments? A, analytical testing, B, API manufacturer, C, packaging, or D, none of the above? The answer is API manufacturer. Next challenge question is, in a listing submission for a repackager or relabeler, what is the role of the manufacturer's NDC? A, it is not required in a repackager's submission. B, it is included as the source NDC. C, it is provided to the FDA only upon request and D, it is used for relabeling purposes. And the answer is B, it is included as the source NDC. The manufacturer's NDC for repackager or relabeler must be entered under source NDC. In summary, Cedar Direct plays a key role in streamlining the SPL creation process. It is user-friendly, the real-time validation, pre-validation, the tutorials, and guidance make SPL creation accessible and efficient. The save and validate feature allows for pre-submission error identification and uh, correction, making sure that the submission is error-free. Staying updated with the latest rules is essential for error-free submission and re regulatory compliance. For more detailed guidance on uh, validation, please review the SPL implementation guide with validation procedures. Thank you all for your attendance and participation in our presentation. If you have any questions or need further information, please email us at edrls at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you for that great presentation. For our last session before the final Q&A panel, we'll welcome back Julian Chun.
to provide us with case studies for an interactive learning experience on numerous topics covered today. Please join me to welcome Julian Chun. Hello again. In this presentation, I will go over some compliance cases, do a little bit of studies about some of the mistakes that we're getting, and hopefully educate you guys on how to prevent these mistakes, but also how to fix them. So my objectives are for you to identify the most common listing deficiency issue, recognize the various types of strength errors, that's a giveaway, it, um, and then also examine the consequences resulting from these strength errors. Okay, so let's get started here. For our first case study um, on strength errors, let's examine uh, the antiseptic chlorhexidine uh, 4%. So in the ingredient detail section under the products, you see here chlorhexidine acetate, the numerator strength, they used four milligrams, and then the denominator strength, they used one ml. Is that right? Does that sound like chlorhexidine 4%? So actually, no. So this one I classify as a calculation error because 4% is defined as 4 grams over 100 ml. So if you wanted to, um, to use milligrams instead of grams, you would have to just do 4,000 milligrams, which is the same as 4 grams, over 100 ml. So you reduce it down to the ml, it would be 40 milligrams over one, over one ml. So 40 milligram over one ml, that's 4%. So what you're seeing in Cedar Direct, what they used was four milligrams per one ml, and that is actually 0.4%, not 4%. So a consequence of that is now the listed strength is 10 times less than the actual amount. So because they miscalculated uh, the grams and milligrams, then you're getting um, the wrong percentage amount. All right, so another um, case regarding strength error is this antiperspirant um, aluminum chlorohydrate 10%, okay? And then in the ingredient details, what do you guys see? Aluminum chlorohydrate, okay, that's right. Strength. 10 milligrams, denominator strength, 100 ml. Does that sound right to you guys? 10 milligrams over 100 ml? Sounds like 10%, right? Well, actually, 10%, remember I said is 10 grams over 100 ml, not 10 milligrams, 10 grams. So as entered in Cedar Direct, uh, aluminum chlorohydrate 10 milligrams over 100 ml, the strength is actually 0.01%, not 10%. And that makes the listed strength 1,000 times less than the actual amount. So I classify this as a unit of measure error because if they had just used grams instead of milligrams, everything would have been right. Um, could also be considered a calculation error, uh, but this is just an example of some of the the errors that we're seeing. All right, so um, another case study here. We have um, a wart remover. So salicylic acid, 40%. So I cut and paste uh, the drug facts that's on the label, representative label that's in the SPL. So salicylic acid, 40%, and then cut and paste here the um, number of patches in the box, four medicated patches. Here is the Cedar Direct um, ingredient details and how they decided to list the strength. Salicylic acid, okay, strength 40 milligrams, okay, denominator strength four with a unit of measure of one. So what does that tell us? 40 milligrams with a denominator strength of four. So as entered in Cedar Direct, 
This is uh, salicylic acid, four milligram in four. So what is the strength? So what they're saying is there's four milligrams in four patches or in each, in one. So 40 milligrams in four patches, which means there's 10 milligrams in each patch. I'm not really sure. Um, so I classify this as an invalid strength because the strength doesn't really make sense. It doesn't jive with the labeling and um, you're not even really sure what they're trying to say is the strength. So a salicylic acid 40%, again 40% is 40 grams over 100 grams, and this is weight, uh, weight per weight. We've been doing weight per volume, so weight per weight is gram over gram. So 40 grams over 100 grams, or if you wanted to reduce it, it reduce it to a per gram basis, then it would be 0.4 grams in one gram. So after you've established that this 40 grams over 100 grams is 40%, then what you need to tell us in the SPL is how many grams are in the, these patches. So how, how much of the 40% um, is in these patches. So if you're saying then there's one gram in each patch, and then later you have to tell us that there's four patches in one box. So this is the proper way to tell us that this is a salicylic acid, 40% in each patch, um, and, and how many patches in each box. So the consequences of having this invalid strength is that it doesn't report the actual amount of patches. So um, nobody really knows what's in there, what the strength is, the quantity, nobody knows because the, the strength, the way it's listed, it doesn't make any sense. The um, correct way to do this, just so you guys have experience, is okay, salicylic acid, and then it's 0.4 grams over one gram. This says check mark 40%, okay? Now in the packaging section, um, if you want to assign your innermost label to patch a um, package NDC, then you can do so. And then, you, <clears throat> excuse me, and then you tell us um, what the, uh, the type is. So it's a patch um, and then the quantity. So you are putting one gram in that one patch. And please note that this gram right here needs to match the... Um, this gram right here needs to match the gram here. Otherwise, um, you're gonna get a validation error. So you're telling us how much how much of the 40% is, is in each patch. Then in the outermost label, you, um, you have to assign this one a package NDC. And then what, what is it? So it's a box and how many boxes, um, or how many patches are in the box? So four patches and the unit of measure is one because each, um, it's eaches, each patch. So this is how you would add the corrected strength and packaging in Cedar Direct. All right, so ready for another case study? Uh, here we go. So this one, in this strength error, the drug product is a cough suppressant, dextromethorphan, 15 milligrams per teaspoon. And what you're seeing here in the content of labeling and their drug facts is that the active ingredients they're saying is actually dextromethorphan 10 milligrams. And then in the box image on the representative label, you see that it's dextromethorphan 15 milligrams per teaspoon. So uh, what is it? W what's going on? So this one I classify as mismatched strength. And why that is, is because you have content of labeling that has a different strength from the image of the representative label and or the SPL, sometimes the SPL will match the content of labeling, sometimes it'll match the, um, the representative image label, or sometimes it's, it's completely different, but in three different places, you can have three different strengths. And as you can tell from this example, if that's the case, there's a potential for one third misdosing. And if this is given to a kid, that can, can make a big difference. But also it's providing, um, it's, it's creating a lot of confusion for patients and healthcare providers. What is the actual strength of this product? You're seeing it um, a different a different strength in different places, so it's really creating a lot of confusion. Okay, 
So for our last case study of a strength error, um, I want to give you guys an example of, um, of this laxative uh, glycerin 2 gram suppository. This is my favorite um, type of strength error case, and you'll see why in the next one. Okay, so here's the um, image, glycerin, the um, drug facts in the, the box image. So glycerin uh, 2 grams, and here it is again. This is how it's listed. Glycerin, 83 in the numerator, grams, um, 100 grams. So if you're shaking your head like I am when I first saw this, then you pretty much hit the nail on the head here. So as entered in Cedar Direct, they entered it as 83 grams in um, 100 grams. There's no rhyme or reason in the mistake. Um, you can't tell wh where they even got that from, and I just classify these as sloppy errors because they, um, you you don't know how they came up with it. it uh, you just feel like it's random, and they're they're inputting it in. And every time I see this, I just have to. Uh, just have to shake my head and 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 say, are, do these people really need to be in um, the drug business? So as a consequence of that, it, it's a completely wrong strength. Um, it makes your firm look unprofessional to have something published with such a complete and utter error. Um, and also, I wanted to remind you guys that um, once you've listed a drug product with a strength you're not allowed to change that strength. So an NDC is associated with a drug and a strength and it stays that way through the life of that NDC. Now, if you made a mistake and you need us to fix an initial strength error, that requires a manual override. So we have to review it, make sure that it is um, an actual strength, make sure it was an initial um, an initial error and not some sort of changes to the NDC. And then we have to submit that manual override, which then also has to be reviewed by the SPL coordinator and then process. So this can be pretty lengthy. It's manual. It's time consuming. So making sure you enter the correct strength the first time is super, super important. So in summary, Strength errors are the most common listing deficiencies that we're seeing both historically and in the past year. Errors can be due to mistakes in calculating, using the, the wrong unit of measures, milligrams versus grams, um, and the way they enter it, just invalid strength. Uh, the, it's random how they do it. Um, there can be mismatches in the content of labeling, the representative image, and the SPL and or it just could be due to carelessness and just not paying attention. So strength errors have real world impacts. Um, they, it's, so it's very, very important for you guys to make sure to get it, um, to submit it to us uh, correctly. So uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, I'll be around to answer any questions. Um, for questions that you're not able to address uh, today, you can send us an email at eaterlist at fda.hhs.gov for compliance related questions. If you just want to know how to enter in on Cedar Direct, um, you're still a little bit confused about you know the numerator strength, denominator strengths, these technical questions you can send to Cedar Direct at fda.hhs.gov. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for those real world case studies. We'll now enter into our final Q&A panel as a reminder. If you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We have questions already coming in. The first group of questions will be addressed to Lieutenant Commander Jason Two. And here's the first question for Commander Two. When will the FY 2024 facility fees be announced? 
That's a great question. So the fiscal year 2024 OMUFA facility user fee rates will be announced in the Federal Register notice an, around March 2024. We highly encourage you visiting the OMUFA user fee website and subscribing to our listserv to receive the most up-to-date information regarding the OMUFA user fee program. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question, Commander Two. We do have a few more questions for you, and here is the next question. What, what are the criteria to be considered as a CMO facility? Thank you for the question. So a CMO facility is an OTC monograph drug facility where neither the owner nor any affiliate of the owner or facility sells the OTC monograph drug produced at such facility directly to wholesalers, retailers, or consumers in the United States. If you are still unsure about your facility's operations as a CMO, and if those operations meet the definition of fee liable, please email Cedar Collections at fda.hhs.gov so that we may assist you. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And got another question for Commander Two, and it's the following. Does a facility that makes generic OTC drugs need to pay both GADUFA and OMUFA fees? That's a good question. So GADUFA and OMUFA are independent user fee programs and have their own fee obligations. If your facility manufactures both generic and over-the-counter monograph drug products, you will be liable for both fees. Payment of GDUFA fees or any other user fee program does not remove your obligation for OMUFA user fees. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Moving on to our next panelist, we've got a questions that came in for David Mazik, and here is the first question. Why is it worth making an NDC reservation instead of requesting an NDC code? Thank you for the question, Ray. Um, it's imperative that you use that uh, NDC reservation, as I mentioned in the presentation, for pre-launch activities. Uh, for one, these are products that are recently being approved but not in commercial distribution. And then secondly, um, just to verify or uh, uh, make certain that you're not using um, an NDC that has already been assigned under that particular label or code. Thank you for responding to that question. We have a few more questions for David Mazik, and here's the next one. What if you're adding a new product code route to an, an existing listed product? How would you do that? So keep in mind the NDC reservation is, is product specific. And so if you're adding a, let's say a new product, a new strength, that would be a separate um, NDC altogether or a separate reservation. So it's for an individual uh, in case, maybe um, from the standpoint of an indiv individual case. Um, just to clarify in one, of the, in one of the slides, I mentioned about having everything under one file. In essence, what I was talking about was uh, multiple NDCs um, for a particular labeler code. Um, so you, you could have multiple products, obviously different product uh, numbers, which correspond to the ingredient amounts for those products. So um, just for the clarification, that's simply for the individual products that you would have that situation. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more for David Mazik, and here is the next question. Which particular data elements are required to complete the NDC reservation process? The data elements that are required are, um, first and foremost, the labeler name, uh, the labeler duns, uh, the ND see product code and that product code encompasses the labeler code and the product number specific to um, <clears throat> an ingredient and or a strength the uh, non-proprietary name uh, the specific dosage form um, the marketing stat status which is very important as well 
the reserved until date, and finally, one active ingredient. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for David Mazik, and here is the question. Which submission types are prohibited in the NDC reservation tool? Thanks again, Ray, for that question. Um, and unfortunately, folks, the kit submissions are excluded from the NDC reservation. Um, the, the system will prompt you to say, hey, look, that you cannot submit a kit submission. The combination products uh, cannot use the NDC reservation, unfortunately. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a few questions that did come in for Julian Chun. And here is the first question. Should we assign the NDC number for sample size? Thanks, Ray, for those questions. Um, so for samples, they do require an NDC. Samples are considered to be con uh, commercially distributed and they are a unique package size and type. So you do need to assign an NDC to samples. Thank you for responding to that question. A few more questions for Julian Chun, and here's the next question. Are package codes to be uniform across all products or specific for each NDC product code? So each product code can have its own uh, set of package codes. So they do not have to be uniform across all products. Each product code can have uh, their own package codes and package codes designations. Thank you for responding to that question. Next question for Julian Chan. Will the addition of a leading zero lead to an issuance of a new labeler code to each manufacturer? So under the proposed rule, um, the leading zero it's it, it's not considered a new labeler code it's called an it's going to be a new format to your labeler code so if you have a four digit labeler code you'll have two uh, leading zeros attached to it it's the same labeler code it's just going to be formatted and you have to use the leading zeros and if you have a five digit labeler code you'll have a one leading zero in front of it and that will be um, the new format but it's not a new labeler code it's the same labeler code Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a few more NDC code questions. And here's the next question for Julian Chan. Is it currently true that the NDC number is not required for an API? And are there any plans to make this a requirement? Uh, that is not true. APIs require NDCs, so um, they, they need to be listed and have an NDC assigned to them. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Julian Chun, is the proposed new NDC format only applicable to an FDF or also an API? The, the proposed rule is for all NDCs, so for FDFs and for APIs, for all NDCs. Thank you for clarifying that. And another question for Julian Chun. If the proposed rule is finalized for an existing NDC with a five-digit labeler code, a three-digit product code, and a two-digit package code, would a zero be added in front of the labeler and product code? Right, so it would it would you would need to add a, a leading zero to the front of the labeler code to make that six digits, and then another at the product code to make that four digits. So two zeros will um, will have to be added since the NDCs are ten digits. Two leading zeros will have to be added. Uh, basically, you take the HIPAA format and add a leading zero to 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 current NDCs. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions on NDC codes, and here's the next question. After the transition, 
when the drug code goes to four digits, does this make available more drug codes to assign and keep use of a labeler code? So, yeah, assuming that you have a 532 right now, um, if the proposed rule uh, passes the way, or we, we publish it the way that um, it's proposed, then your new um, format will be 642. And at that at that point, you will actually be able to have access to extra product codes. Um, so yeah, you'll get extra product codes, and that's another benefit of this this new rule. Thank you for responding. And this is the final question for Julian Chan in this round. What will happen to labelers to, that are four four two? Will the labeler codes just get leader zeros? Yes, so they, um, if you have a 442, you'll get two leading zeros in your labeler code. Um, and then that will be the new format. So as, as, as proposed. So stay tuned, guys, because um, like I said, we're going through all the comments now that have been submitted. And um, we will be um, publishing something hopefully sometime next year. Uh, but keep, keep yourself in tune for that because then um, there'll, there'll be an, a lot of preparation needed in order to um, get everybody on board for this transition. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. A few questions came in for Lieutenant Commander Sujan Park. And here is the first question. If an NDC number has been closed or discontinued, can NDC numbers be reused on another product? So, no, the answer is no. If an NDC number has been discontinued, then that NDC cannot be reused for another product. If marketing is resumed for a, that discontinued drug and no changes have been made to the drug, that would require a new NDC under 21 CFR 20735. The drug must have the same NDC that was assigned to it before marketing was discontinued. Thank you for that question. Thank you for responding to that question. Uh, no question for Commander Park is the following. Is a new NDC required for changes of an API, API supplier? No, changes to API, API supplier does not require a new NDC. Um, only time a new NDC is required is if it meets the information stated in 21 CFR 207.35. Although this scenario does not require a new NDC, it's uh, important to mention that the drug listing must be updated with new API suppliers information. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The, final, the next question for Commander Park is the following. If I move from a blister configuration to a bottle one, should I change the NDC? So no, if, the, if it's the exact same formulation, same drug product, and it's packaged in a different container materials, then you do not assign a new product code but you will need to assign a different package code. Um, different package sizes and types cannot share the same package code. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The final question for Commander Park in this round is the following. Is it required to update the NDC code if the embossing or imprinting details change through supplementary filing approval? Yes, so a new product code is required, uh, once again, for 21 CFR 20735, when there is a change to drug physical characteristics, so such as size, shape, uh, which also includes, includes code and print. So um, it will require a new product code. Um, for drugs that are subject to FDA review and application approval process, just remember that NDCs are not reviewed during that approval process. Thank you so much. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. A few questions came in for Tasneen Hussein. And here is the first question. Is an email answering the letter with the evidence that a manual override was requested sufficient evidence of a correction? 
Hi, thank you for the question. It's a good question. Um, so an email is not sufficient if it doesn't include the SPL file, the corrected submission file, because we need to see the file. So you need to send us the core ID or the submission ID so we can review the file and make sure that all the corrections are made because most likely we'll need a manual override. So once we review the file and make the correction, uh, make sure that it's all corrected and that there are new, no new errors, then we have to uh, send it to the SPL coordinator for to perform the override. So the make sure that you do send us a submission ID or the core ID along with an e uh, email that you have requested it. Or um, also our deficiency letters and our warning letters and untitled letters actually um, state in the letter itself what you need to do and what you need to send to us um, for it to be um, sufficient. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Tasneen Hussein is the following. How long after the resolution of a warning letter will it take for the closeout letter to arrive? Well, thanks for that question. Um, we cannot really give an exact time frame um, because we have to usually wait for the manual override for the new uh, submission to be uploaded. And because we are not under, we, this is not under our control, we don't know exactly when that will happen. Um, as soon as, you know, the new SPL is uploaded, then um, it will not take much long after that. Um, I can probably say within a couple of weeks altogether, usually is when we can um, most likely issue the closeout letter. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Tasneen Hussein is the following. Please further explain the difference between E and I category for NDC directory flags. Thank you for that question, yes. So the E flag will appear um, when FDA removed the listing data because it had errors in the data. So FDA will usually send a deficiency letter when we find errors and if that information, if the deficiency letter is not resolved, if the firm does not respond to us within 30 days, then we remove that data manually because it has errors in the data. So then that's when you see the E flag. Um, for the I flag, it that appears because FDA has actually um, already inactivated the data because it wasn't corrected for a, a certain long period of time. And the next inactivation period, um, if the data is still not corrected, then it will get inactivated. So then that's when you will see the I flag. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have just a couple more questions for Tasneen Hussein. And here's the next question. What are the responsibilities of private label distributors? Okay, so private label distributors um, basically do not have to register. Um, they're not required to register since they do not have any uh, manufacturing activities. So FDA will accept listing information submitted from a PLD uh, if they are acting as an authorized agent for the registered establishment. Um, PLDs have a choice. So they have a choice whether they can list or not list. So if they choose not to list, then the CMO is responsible to submit two listings. So one listing has to be the under the name and NDC of the CMO, and one has to be under the name and label and NDC of the PLD. And this is ultimately the responsibility of the CMO. But if the PLD does decide to list, then they do so as an authorized agent, and they'll be responsible for all the data that they submit. Um, and then when they submit, I mean, when they decide to list, they have to first, uh, first they have to make sure that they get a DUNCE number um, from DNB, and then they have to request a labeler code. And once they have the labeler code assigned, they then they have to create the 10-digit NDC and then submit the listing to us. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And this will be the final question for Tasneem Hussein in this round of questions. What is the manual override process? Okay, so that's an excellent question. And this is something that you know happens all the time. We get lots of questions and there's always some confusion around this. So um, the most important thing to know about this process is that it's the manual overrides are performed by the SPL coordinator. And this is not under our control. So the timing all depends on when the coordinator has time or whatever his, um, you know, it goes in order. So um, as he receives them, he will, take care of the overrides. Um, the manual overrides have to be approved by CEDAR or the center under which the product was listed. So 
if you know it was a product of ours, we have to make sure that everything is corrected and then we approve the override. So these can take time. Um, so firms have to send us uh, send you know a manual request in writing to the SPL coordinator. If they're sending it to the SPL coordinator, they have to send it at spl.fda.hhs.gov. Um, the the request must always be one request, uh, one ID, uh, one product per request. Um, they must include the core ID or the submission ID in the request. It, um, it must in, they should include the error statement and the reason for the manual override. Um, so now if the manual overrides are for products with compliance cases, um, then it's generally best to send us the information, such as the core ID or the submission ID, because we need to review it first. Um, we want to make sure that everything is corrected. And then once it's, we review it and everything is correct, then we, you know, we again approve the override and then we send it to the SPL coordinator who, who does the override. Then once that's performed, the new SPL will be uploaded. So overall, the manual override process is a little long, but um, as I stated in, in my presentation also, um, if you just follow our steps and what we request from you, if you send all that to us, it shouldn't be too difficult. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelists, we have a next group of questions addressed to Vikas Aurora. And here is the first question. What is the appropriate timing to remove a site that is no longer manufacturing a drug if the product the site did manufacture is still on the market and hasn't expired yet? Hi, Ray. Thank you for that question. So if a product is still in the market and the manufacturing establishment has changed, this uh, needs to be updated in the drug listing by the June or December requirement, depending on when the update happened. Um, the establishment that's being removed can remain a registered establishment, especially if it's manufacturing drug product um, for other other uh, applic other applicants, but should no longer be referenced in the current drug listing. Um, if you if the if you're ending commercial distribution of the drug product, the drug listing should be updated to add a complete status with the end marketing date that aligns with the expiration date of the last lot of drug product in commercial distribution. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. I've got a couple more questions for, for Vikas Aurora, and here is the next question. Can my drug be legally marketed if I forget to certify my drug listing? Thank you for that question. So if a drug is in commercial distribution and the listing is inactivated due to a lack of certification or referencing an unregistered establishment, or a compliance case, the drug is considered misbranded while it's not properly listed with the FDA. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. This one last question for Vikas Aurora is the following. If my drug is no longer distribution, why do I need to delist if the drug listing has already been inactivated? Thanks for that question, Ray. Ray. Um, so as mentioned in my presentation, inactivation doesn't provide exemption to the listing obligations. Data inactivation doesn't tell FDA whether a drug has been removed from commercial distribution and doesn't tell us when it was removed um, since there was not a marketing end date provided. So this can contribute to having incorrect information in our databases and doesn't allow us to accurately uh, determine what's, what is in the supply chain. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a, a few more questions that came in for Leila Raju Esfandieri. And here is the first question. Can you elaborate on the use of an inner and an outer NDC and when it is required? So, um... Multi-level packaging is a big subject in registration and listing, and it lends a hand actually to drug amount reporting. So in order to have a correct drug amount reporting under Section 510 of the Act, um, you also have to have correct packaging information. And that includes 
uh, products that have multi-level packaging. So let's say, for example, you have a blister pack that is, um, you know, let's say three blister packs in a carton. Uh, the carton will have its own NDC package code and the blister packs will have their own NDC package codes, um, which have to be different, obviously. Um, the quantity and the uh, type of packaging in that example are different and therefore a new NDC package code is required. So inclusion of those packaging descriptions in the house supplied se section and the requirements are a little bit different than, um, than drug listing. In your drug listing, you have to include information of all packaging, um, including inner and, and outer uh, package codes with their corresponding um, sizes and description. Um, and in the labeling section, in, in how supplied section of labeling for human prescription drugs, um, that is um, what we know as ordinarily available for prescribing um, is, is the language that is used that is included in um, section 16 of your labeling. So there is a little bit of difference between what you include in the listing and in you're required to include in your labeling. But the idea is that every NDC and its corresponding package code and the relationship between those packaging must be included in your drug listing. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Next question for Leila Rajwas Fondiri is the following. Are different sizes of packaging required to be listed or are the various sizes optional? Um, so this um, is similar to the previous question. And the answer is that different sizes, uh, they all have to be listed and they all have to be assigned their own um, NDC package codes. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And here's another question on NDCs for Leila Rajwas Fondari, and it's kind of long, so uh, we can repeat it if we need to. When assigning an NDC for a multi-level package type that is not a kit, should the inner and outer packaging components have the same or different NDCs if the product can be dispensed individually? Uh, so this question might be a little bit different just because um, the, the, you're talking about a kit and you're talking about inner components of a kit um, and the inner packaging. Um, so in terms of NDC assignment, they all have to be assigned, again, uh, different NDCs with the relationships um, available in the drug listing. Uh, but this question is probably a little bit different because it asks about if that inner um, package is actually in commercial distribution. And the answer is that in those cases, you have to make sure that that NDC with its um, entire package code segment is listed as a separate listing, basically. Um, uh, so you have another SPL that includes that product with its NDC product code and package code, which then tells FDA that this is um, a product that is available outside of this kit. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And we have a, another question for uh, Leila Rajuas Fondari on uh, repackager listing. And who is responsible for repackager listings? We've noticed listings on Daily Med referencing our NDA with incorrect information. So repackagers uh, are entities that uh, typically, um, you know, buy products in bulk and, and put them in smaller bottles or packaging and relabel and put the product in the market. Um, unfortunately, um, sometimes they don't have a relationship with um, the, the applicant or source drug manufacturer and um, um, the, the consequences of their drug listing is uh, is that because of that um, lack of relationship, which is not encouraged by FDA at all, um, then some of the data is, um, is incorrect. So um, repackagers 
under the Section 510 of the Act are considered drug manufacturers. So all the requirements, including registration and listing requirements, apply to repackager um, of a drug and relabeler of the drug um, to that sense. So um, if there is a drug that is repackaged and, um, you know, um, put in the market, whether if it's in a hospital setting or clinic, um, as long as it's not under common ownership with that clinic or hospital, um, or it's sold to, um, you know, pharmacies or um, dispensed to patients, then it has to have um, its own, it has to be listed by the repackager or relabeler, and it has to have um, the appropriate NDC on the label. Um, I want to make it very clear that pharmacies um, that do repackaging under the practice of pharmacy, whether if it's in a clinic or hospital or a retail pharmacy, are exempt from registration and listing. Thank you. Thank you for answering the group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. We have a few questions that came in for Pui Humor. And here is the first question. When submitting an NDC reservation, will the data submitted be validated like it is during a drug listing submission? Thank you, Ray. Yes, so when submitting an NDC reservation, the process is slightly different from a typical you know, drug listing submission uh, because the NDC reservations have fewer required fields, but um, for each of the mandatory fields in the NDC reservation, it does go through the same validation uh, to make sure that the information entered is um, accurate. Um, also for a full validation procedure specific to NDC reservation, um, we have uh, the SPL implementation guide uh, specifically under section 3.1.8.21. So that is uh, that section is dedicated to validation information for NDC reservation. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. I've got a couple more questions for Pui Huber. And here is the next one. What are the options for animal drug products? So our office focuses primarily um, on human drug registration listing for human products. Uh, so for assistance with any animal uh, registration and listing, please reach out to CVM, the Center for Veterinary Medicine, at askcvm, A-S-K-C-V-M, at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one more question for Pui Huber, and here's the question. When will the error code for a vaccine label document type with a marketing category of approved drug product manufactured under contract be resolved? Thank you. Uh, great question. I saw there were several questions uh, regarding the error code for vaccine label. Um, we are aware of the error code for document type vaccine label uh, that is associated with any marketing category of under contract. We are actively working to fix this issue, uh, but in the meantime, these type of submissions need to be uh, loaded manually. Um, so if you have any questions or need to make a manual request uh, for override requests, uh, before it's sent to the coordinator, please email cberspl, um, cberspl at fda.hhs.gov. Thank you. Thank you for responding to those questions. Moving down to our final panelist, Julian Chan. We do have a few questions that came in for Julian Chan, and here's the first question. If an NDC was approved where the unit of measure of strength in grams and the package unit of measure is also in grams, now the package unit of measure changes to mLs, can I update the existing NDC or do I need to submit a new listing? Thanks for that question, Ray. So, um, if the unit of measure changes from grams to ml that's telling us that 
it's going from a solid dosage form to a liquid dosage form. And that would require a new listing because you're not allowed to retain the same NDC if there's been any dis uh, changes in the distinguishing characteristics of a drug product. So that one would, would not qualify to keep the same NDC. Thank you for responding to that question. I've got a couple more questions for Julian and Chun, and here's the next one on bulk ingredients. For bulk ingredients that are frequently distributed in different quantities based on customer orders, how should the configuration be presented? And if it's an API, how should the strength be presented? So um, what we currently recommend is that if you um, – are in the situation you would just list like for instance one gram over one gram and then treat your orders for say for instance to 17 grams as um 17 units that way you're listed once and then you don't have to list all the different package types um that's one way to do it another way to do it is um if you are sending like uh drums like a 55 gallon drum you can list uh, the 55 gallon drum as a package strength and then uh, ship orders in, in that um, that container and slight, things slightly less in that same one. So there's various ways to kind of um, to list so that you don't have to list all the different strengths based on the um, different configurations. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple minutes left, and the next question is for Julian Chun. And as a follow-up to NDC assignment for sample size, are PDP images for sample sizes required to be included in the drug listing, or are the sample size NDCs only required in the metadata and not the PDPs? So when you list a um, when you list a drug product, you sh the principal display panel, the image should be a representative um, image of the label. So if um, you have a representative label, it can it doesn't have to be all the different um, sizes, the samples, the thirty count bottle, the hundred count bottle, whatnot. It just, just just has to be one label that's a representative label of all um, of all of that product type. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got just under one minute. We're going to try to squeeze one more question in. This will be our last question, and it was came in for Leila Raju Isfandiari, and here is the question: Is there a requirement to have? the NDC number on oxygen tank labels? So we had this question asked three times, so I'm guessing it's an urgent one for whoever asked it. Um, so if you are uh, dealing with a medical gas, if, if the oxygen is a medical gas, it is considered a drug, and therefore it has to be listed. One thing you have to remember is that drug listing and NDC assignment are not always the same as inclusion of NDC in the labeling, because under 201, you are never required to include a human readable format of the NDC on your drug label, although we encourage you and we request that you include it. But nevertheless, the product is listed. A drug has always has to be listed, um, uh, and the NDC, therefore, is part of drug listing and is assigned even if the manufacturer distributor chooses not to print it on the drug label. All right, well, that's all the time we have for questions in this final panel. A huge thank you to our speakers and panelists for answering numerous questions, providing numerous demonstrations during the entire day.